Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I hope you had a nice day yesterday in Barcelona. And uh, this morning, it's uh, uh, with great pleasure that uh, we can introduce uh, this year's uh, key lecture sponsored by uh, the ELSAS Foundation, Iona Novak. And uh, Iona Novak is uh, the winner of the ELSAS Foundation's Research Prize in uh, 2021. And the prize is given to a researcher that has a bit, uh, given a, um, a great impact in research within the cerebral palsy. The prize is one million Danish kroner. It's around uh, 135,000 euros. And uh, just now, there is an opening uh, for nomina nominations for uh, the Research Prize 2023. So we, in the ELSAS Foundation, encourage everyone to nominate qualified candidates for the Research Prize 2021. And you can go on our website or uh, scan the QR code in the flyer in your ESED bag, uh, and please nominate qualified candidates. The deadline is the 31st uh, of May, so you have approximately a week. We hope to get a lot of candidates. <laughs> And I now will pass the word to Bernard Dan, uh, also a former uh, winner of the uh, Research Prize in the ELSAS Foundation, and you will introduce uh, Iona. Yes, it's a great honor. And we have a tradition, Iona and myself, every time we are on the podium together, as, as it <laughs> happens so often, the last time was the last physical meeting in Perth. And this is it. Now, I was um, indeed very honored to be the inaugural recipient uh, of this very prestigious award. Not only prestigious, I think that it's really a push for the domain of very much needed encouragement. And this is very much in keeping with what we've been doing within the EACD. And I'm very uh, thankful to the ELSAS Foundation for the work that we have been doing, the Foundation and the Academy hand in hand and I know that we have more projects together, and, and this is very, well, encouraging, and I'm very enthusiastic about it. Now, I was the inaugural recipient, and then came Iona, and this affirmed uh, some connection between us. And indeed, uh, Pat Patricia said that the deadline really for submission, for nomination, is the, the 31st, but ha have in mind that it's really tomorrow. Say, by the end of the meeting, you know uh, who you think should be promoted. It's not just an honor, it's really an encouragement to actual research because that, that money, well, the, the largest part of the money is to be used uh, for more research for the benefit of people with cerebral palsy. Iona was an excellent recipient. Iona Novak, many of you know her and all of us know her name, so this is an opportunity to see her. <laughs> it's not the first time she's been on the EACD, and many of us still remember the, the keynote lecture that she delivered at the very first inter meeting of the International Alliance uh, of Academies of Childhood Disability, joint with the EACD meeting in Stockholm. Now, Iona is... Um, is at CP Alliance and she chaired Allied Health. She has been a mentor to many. She's been, um, she has a way, a, what you might say, thought provoking, um, very frank, open, um, a way of bringing ideas that are not all that, um, well, complex or, or inconceivable but to say, if there is a possibility, we need to see what this may bring, and in a scientific way. Iona is one of those people, and I recognize many in the room, who said, ch ch childhood disability, and in particular cerebral palsy, has been there for too long 
without deserving the right level of research about management, about optimal management. As I say, the ideas to start with are not all that complex, and the first resource might be open resources like Wikipedia. But as Iona will uh, tell us, there might be more uh, to cerebral palsy than what we can find on Wikipedia. Iona. Sincere thanks to the Alsace Foundation. I am very humbled and very grateful. Thank you also, Professor Dan. When Cooley Coley was born with cerebral palsy, the villagers where she lived told her parents to drown her in the river. Her parents fortunately never followed their advice. And today, she's a poet. And I want to read you something from one of her most important poems called Mine. I have a dream. Please don't influence it. It belongs to me. I have to follow a path. Please don't obstruct it. It belongs to me. I have an amazing life. Please let me live it. It belongs to me. I have a choice. Please don't choose it for me. It belongs to me. So how many choices does she have when it comes to treatment? And do we make those choices for her? Or does she get to make those choices? It's said now that medical information doubles every 73 days. When we recently looked at the cerebral palsy literature, there are over 180 different intervention options. That's a lot of choices. We also found in the last six years that the information just at the high quality level had tripled. And there's no reason to think that this exponential curve might slow down. So how do we make all these choices? Well, today's talk is what Wikipedia can't tell you. Wikipedia can be updated, but it can't interpret change and whether that change matters. Wikipedia can't read children's minds. And Wikipedia can't make your decision for you. So, Wikipedia can be updated, but it can't interpret changes. So I, today, I'm going to talk about the top five things that I think have changed in the cerebral palsy field recently and why they really matter for intervention choices. The first of these is that in high-income countries, the rate of cerebral palsy has fallen by a staggering 30% after 60 years of the rate being the same. This means that this condition is partially preventable. This work has come about through extraordinary collaborations with obstetricians and neonatologists, thinking about very early interventions for mothers and for children. Very early interventions. Not only has the rate fallen, but the condition has a less severe form if you're born in a high-income country. And people are born with less comorbidities, such as epilepsy and intellectual disability, than ever before. So if we look at this data here from the Australian Cerebral Palsy Register, in the 1980s, about half of people with cerebral palsy could walk. Now three in four people can walk. And what does that mean? It means that these smaller injuries and less comorbidities mean people are more likely than ever before to respond to interventions. So our choices and people's choices really matter. It also long term means a higher likelihood of employment and that's really important. If we look at this data from the Sweden register, if you have a more severe disability you're more likely to be unemployed. If you have epilepsy or intellectual disability you're more likely to be unemployed. So the reduction in severity and the reduction in the number of comorbidities really will matter for people's long term. What I think is number three, and it's a really new paradigm, is that heritable causes of cerebral palsy exist. 
Just less than 10 years ago, we used to say cerebral palsy only is not a genetic disorder. It's not inherited. We knew that 1% of people on the cerebral palsy register had a sibling or a close family member with people with cerebral palsy. But now we think it's as much as 30 to 40% of people have a genetic component to their etiology. And why is this important? This is not splitting it up into lots of different diagnoses with new names. It's still a cause of cerebral palsy, but it's important because it will mean there are new therapies that will come in the future that are different to the ones we're talking about today. Recently, the International Genetics Consortium of Cerebral Palsy looked and found at least 298 different genes involved in the causal pathway to cerebral palsy. But importantly there in the middle, you can see there's at least a 10 gene overlap with intellectual disability, epilepsy and autism spectrum disorder. And that helps to explain why many people with cerebral palsy also have these other conditions and why they respond differently to different interventions. So let's think about a different condition, spinal muscular atrophy. Solgensma has been a game changer for these children, a single gene therapy. So in the past, these children required palliative care from people like you in the room. But these days, rehabilitation is involved in helping these children learn functional skills, not dissimilar to cerebral palsy. In fact, some of them are sealing off the top of these uh, tests that we use as the gold standard. So it won't be as simple for cerebral palsy because it's not one gene. We saw that in that data. However, it'll be a complex interaction between genetics, the environment and psychosocial factors, which you're all experts at already. But it's going to mean, in addition to our partnerships with obstetricians and neonatologists, we now need partnerships with geneticists, partnerships with immunologists to look at this complex metabolic, epigenetic, immunogenetic and inflammatory component to cerebral palsy, which we haven't really focused on before. And that's what precision medicine will look like in the future. Number four, we now actually know what works. We built this simple traffic light some time ago. I'll just walk you through it in case you're not familiar with it. So green is an intervention that's proven to work in clinical trials. It's a go intervention. Red is the exact opposite, an intervention that's been shown in clinical trials to either have no benefit over nothing or to cause harm to children, so we call it a stop intervention. And yellow is everything else. Maybe it's promising, but more research would increase our confidence. Maybe there's no evidence, or maybe there's conflicting evidence. One group gets success, the other group can't replicate it. What do you do if you're the parent? Which one do you choose? Who do you believe? So yellow means measure outcomes. And we were able to move on from mapping the colour code of every intervention to these things called bubble charts. So just to orientate you to the bubble charts, on the vertical axis or the y-axis at the top are effective treatments and at the bottom are ineffective treatments. Each bubble there on screen is a different intervention. There's over 180 of them in cerebral palsy and they're mapped by topic. So that first big bunch is motor. The colour of each circle relates to the traffic light and the size of the bubble relates to how much research has been done. So the bigger the bubble, more research. Now you can see there's a lot of yellow bubbles in there, but we've got an accumulating number of green ones. But importantly, right through the yellow section, there's something called the worth it line. So an intervention can fall above or below the worth it line. And think of the yellow ones a little bit like champagne. The bubbles rise. So the higher they rise closer to green, the bigger the effect size. And the fifth one is that early diagnosis is now possible before six months of age, right in the pocket of optimal neuroplasticity. In 2017, we were able to develop a clinical practice guideline with parents and with all the professionals you might imagine would be involved in a diagnosis. And we also went on to work and collaborate with the Italian group to look at a case control study. And from that recommendation, we recommended three tests for identification of cerebral palsy early. MRI, indicating damage to the motor area, the general movements assessment, where the score is absent fidgety, 
and the Hammersmith Infant Neurological Examination, which has cutoff scores for indicating likelihood of cerebral palsy. And we found that if all three tests are indicating high likelihood of cerebral palsy, in combination, the child in front of you has a 98% chance of having cerebral palsy. That's a very high diagnostic yield. It's, it's bigger than you would expect, and it's bigger than we see in some of the more common conditions like Parkinson's, for example. So we've, we, we've been able to identify this condition early. So can you do it in the real world, however? Well, let's look now at three groups worldwide that have published knowledge translation studies implementing this guideline. First of all, I'd like to say that all three groups concluded in their papers that implementation of the guideline and early diagnosis is feasible and possible in real-world clinical contexts. Diagnosis traditionally happens somewhere between 12 and 24 months. At the Monash Hospital, they got it down to between 3 and 12 months. That's in Melbourne, Australia. At Cerebral Palsy Alliance, where I work, we have a specific clinic and we got it down to 4 to 8 months. And in an important large network in the United States, they got it down to nine months. So you can see it is possible to get children a diagnosis early. Now, diagnosis is not a destination. It's a gateway to the right intervention, ability to make choices. So we all believe in early intervention. We heard an important keynote yesterday from Mina Hadazalgra. And where is this data going? So I'll just show you some preliminary data from one of our trials called the REACH trial, because now we can diagnose early, we can also start trials early and advance this evidence base. This randomised trial was comparing a green light intervention known as constraint-induced movement therapy head-to-head -head with bimanual therapy, another green light. So we know in older children they're equally effective. We wanted to know whether they're the same in young children, in babies. And they are, they work the same. But importantly in this data, you can see on the difference between the purple, the early line, and red, the late line, that if you had treatment early, you had a far superior result. And this fits with the neuroscience literature we saw come out of Columbia some time ago in kitten studies showing that early training before the brain had finished the connection to the corticospinal tract into the spine was very, very important before six months of age. And this is one of the first human data studies to show this in cerebral palsy. So the traffic light currently says lots of yellow bubbles, small ones, for early intervention, only because we haven't been able to diagnose. So we've had mixed populations in those studies. But I think what we're going to see next time we update this paper is that those bubbles are all going to accumulate into one green bubble that tells us that if you do motor training before six months of age, that is task specific and that involves child-led activities, child active movements, and involves problem solving, will in actually be an effective intervention. That's where this evidence base is going. Okay, so Wikipedia can't read children's minds. I learnt this very early in my research career. One of the first times I used a test called the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, or the COPM, to ask children about their goals, I asked a sassy four-year-old what she would like to do. Now, before I tell you her answer, the important thing to know was we were doing a randomised controlled trial looking at the effectiveness of upper limb botulinum toxin injections compared to control. And here's what she said. I'd like to pee in the backyard like my brother. <laughs> Her mother laughed just as you're laughing now. And I said, you go, girl. <laughs> but inside my head, I was saying to myself, hmm, not sure if you're randomised to Botox or the placebo, we're they're really going to be able to help you with that goal. <laughs> But seriously, children set very important goals and goals that matter to them. And this work is important and we've been told many times from people with cerebral palsy and the qualitative literature that when you use a goal, intervention is more motivating for them. We also know from the neuroscience literature that motivation induces plasticity. You're more likely to train harder if you're interested. So imagine if I said to you, you're here in this wonderful city of Barcelona, you must learn to cook tapas. Now, if you love cooking, that's probably a really exciting concept to get a new skill. If you hate cooking, you're probably not keen that I've said you have to learn to make tapas. You're thinking, I don't want to learn it because then I'm going to get stuck with the cooking. So motivation really does matter. It also fosters agency. 
So just being given a choice fosters self-agency. Being the, given the dignity of asked what matters to you fosters self-agency. So let's have a look at the evidence around this. This is evidence from the adult rehabilitation literature. This is called a forest plot. It has a line down the middle called the line of no effect. The horizontal white lines are the different studies. And we can see most of them fall on the green side, showing that rehabilitation framed by goals is more effective. And that white diamond down the bottom is the summary. And we can see an effect size there of 0.53. So that's a moderate effect size. Or if you think in standard deviations, it's a half a standard deviation better off if you've had rehabilitation framed by goals. That's a big difference. We tried to repeat the same thing in the cerebral palsy literature. We looked at 74 randomised controlled trials and over 700 children with cerebral palsy. And instead of producing forest plots like that last slide, we produced something called a rock curve or a receiver operator curve. And that tells you the threshold. How much do you have to do to get a result? So let me tell you about this literature. So imagine this boy here on screen. He wants to learn to climb the climbing frame in his local park. And what this data tells us that is if we went with him to the park and trained on his local climbing frame, you will start to get an improvement at 14 hours of training intervention. If, however, you, did, you listened to his goal and you took him to the gym, your physiotherapy gym or occupational therapy gym or your rehab centre, and you trained on general gross motor, maybe they were real life activities, but not specifically his goal, it will take 40 hours to get a result in the playground. So you get faster gains when the training is related to the child's goals. Back to the bubble charts. This time I've removed all the yellow ones for point of clarity. I've just left on screen the non-pharmacological interventions and this is about the motor interventions. Okay, so if we code these in another additional way, whether they are at the activities level of the international classification, they're training a real life activity, or whether they're a body structures and functions activity um, or training or intervention, we get a very different result. And you can start to see this very strong trend now. It's very clear from data in our field that activities-based interventions for people with cerebral palsy produce bigger and more effective results. Let's have a look at some more forest plots. Here's a newer intervention for cerebral palsy, co-op or cognitive orientation to occupational performance. It came from the developmental coordination literature. There are now four trials uh, in cerebral palsy and we can see here on this forest plot that the diamond again at the bottom shows a 0.86, so a very large effect size, advantageous to use a training approach or an activities approach over a body structures approach. We also had a recent look at the neurodevelopmental or NDT literature, and we talked a little bit about this literature yesterday. So that I often get told, well, it's really, you're a little bit critical of NDT because there isn't much research. There are actually 35 randomised controlled trials about NDT. So if we start at the bottom there with that red bubble, we first looked at the group of RCTs that compared NDT to no therapy at all. And there was almost no difference in results, 0.1. So that's a very small effect size, hardly any change. Then we compared the trials that looked at an activities approach versus NDT. And there's a very large effect size favouring an activities approach, 0.8. Uh, so we can see this clear dichotomy again in this particular intervention evidence base. And we're starting to happily see this trend happen in speech pathology. It's been a long time coming. The most common cause of death in cerebral palsy is pneumonia after dysphagia. And dysphagia is partly a motor problem. And so we can see here, this is in the adult literature, but a training effect from training swallow. And we have a PhD student at our group who's doing this work, Amanda Kamis, with infants with cerebral palsy and getting very similar results. So hopefully we'll have some new interventions soon. 
Now, we've tried to tie all this information together for you in a clinical practice guideline that looks at who, what, when, and where, how much. So these recommendations I'm going to show you from this clinical practice guideline now are very simple. They're color-coded, just like the traffic lights. Uh, but if you're a person that loves detail, there is a 60-page appendix that goes through the methodology and the extraction. Yeah, I thought you wouldn't want me to go through that today. <laughs> I'll just look at the high-level findings. Okay, so if you want to train mobility, we recommend a goal-directed approach and practice in the real-life environment. Here's Willow at home in her house, and her mum set up this beautiful sidestepping activity for her. And this is their house. A very creative mother. She's doing some more weight shift inside her walker. And her goal, her mum's goal, is for her to walk independently without the walker. Okay, so if it was actually to practice walking and speed and endurance, we suggest overground walking. And you can see her here in a range of environments getting a, a real opportunity to be included and be motivated. You could also think about treadmill training. And you can see here partial body weight support and just the intensity. So it's a good way to up the intensity. But of course, it's easier to walk on a treadmill than it is to walk outside. So you have to do overground practice as well. And you could also consider an intervention called Habitil, hand arm by manual intensive training, including the lower extremity. And we'll look at a video of that. For hand use, and this is for all types of cerebral palsy, max one to four, we recommend a goal-directed approach and a task-specific approach. So you can see here this uh, opportunity that has been set up by this mum to use both hands. And if you have unilateral cerebral palsy, we recommend constraint-induced movement therapy, which you can see on this video. So just watch the rapid changes from a few days of training. The speed and accuracy. but you could also use bimanual training. You get the same result. We suggest, in yellow, because there's less evidence, co-op or habitial, uh, particularly if you're max one to four or have dyskinetic cerebral palsy. They could also be helpful interventions. Or bimanual therapy, using two hands together. And this is for people with bilateral cerebral palsy. And again, we suggest you could think about co-op or habitial for these children as well. What about self-care? We recommended goal-directed training, co-op and habitil. The evidence base is stronger there. Habit, sorry, and you could also think about habitil. You can see these high volume numbers of repetitions. This is a video of habitil. And that's a very intensive training approach. Okay. Now, we also have this guideline written by parents for parents in a series of fact sheets, which you can download for free from our website at cerebralpalsyalliance.org.au. But I'm happy to say this week they've also been translated to Spanish, and I have a copy of them if you need them, but they're also going to be loaded on that website and in the other languages section. They're also available there in Portuguese, and if you'd like to translate them into a language that matters to you and your patients, um, reach out to us and we would be happy to collaborate. We also have a number of guides there for parents that go through this. Again, this information was co-written by parents and it looks at interventions at different ages that improve function. Okay, this third point. Wikipedia can't make a decision for you. And I'm reminded of this important quote from one of the forefathers of evidence-based practice, Gordon Guyatt. Evidence doesn't make decisions, people do. Recently, we wrote a model called the READ model, the Rehabilitation Evidence-Based Decision-Making Model. It works for all diagnostic groups, all ages. Um, but I'm going to apply it today to a, a very Australian child with cerebral palsy. This is what the picture looks like. You can see it's a decision-making tree. I'll go through each of the steps uh, using this case study. So I want you to meet Tom. 
He's nine years old. He has cerebral palsy, gross motor function classification level four. So you can see him out on his farm here in his walking frame. He can take a few steps and he is feeding the cows and he's very good at it. But when we asked Tom what it is he'd like to do, he says, I'd like to muster sheep. So muster sheep, put them all in a pen. And I ask him on the COPM, how, how good at it are you now? 10 is I'm really, really good at it. One is I'm no good at it all. He says, oh, I'm a two out of 10. Most of the sheep get away. So is this goal realistic and feasible is the first step on the read model. Now, I think it's, yeah, I think it's feasible given his farm skills that for him to learn to do this. But I'm not sure about him doing it in that walking frame. I, I don't know. I grew up in a farm. Uh, I don't know how much you know about sheep. Cows are smart, they're slow, they're a perfect match for Tom. Sheep, there's no easy way to say it, they're stupid. <laughs> they operate in the exact opposite way to what you should do in a fire. Instead of a, sh a line calmly towards the door, they take one look at each other and go, panic, and they run around in different directions. So I don't think it's realistic for him to do it in that walker. But however, this is an important conversation that needs to be done compassionately. This is a family who's always focused on activity and they have resisted a wheelchair. But we have a compassionate conversation about how do we meet his goals and could a powered chair help him achieve this goal of mustering? And we go through this process and if you wanted to know more about how to have those complex conversations with families, we do have a publication which is an adaptation of the oncology literature called Spikes Protocol, which steps you through the process of how to have these complex conversations. And his family considered it and they reset the goal together to muster sheep in a powered wheelchair. So next we have to select the evidence-based interventions on this model. So we're considering now, first of all, something for mobility, we're thinking about the power wheelchair. But I can speed him up in a power wheelchair, but that doesn't automatically lead to mustering, right? I, you could hop in a car and go faster than you walk, but that doesn't mean you can muster sheep. Mustering sheep is a learnt skill and it has to be trained. So let's look at the evidence base for wheelchairs. So we can look at these on the bubble charts and you can pull them apart and this is how we do it with families. The evidence base for assistive technology, it's a big bubble, lots of it done, but they're smaller quality studies. And it's not because they don't work, it's because they're difficult to do. Who wants to join the randomised trial that says you can be in a power wheelchair or you can lie on the floor? Who wants to find the funding to do a power wheelchair. We have to give one to every client. It's really expensive to do. This is some of the reasons why this evidence base is lower, not because these devices don't work, but it's important we think about the person environment fit. Okay, so other things on this model we wanna think about is the mechanism of action. We wanna check when we're choosing an intervention, does it match the goal? So yes, a power chair is going to compensate for slow gait. It's a good match, okay, we keep proceeding. Next thing we want to think about is comorbidities. In this case, with his glasses on, he has good vision and normal IQ. I think he's a good candidate to learn to use a power wheelchair. And he has good family support, so they can charge the chair at home and out on that farm, he's going to get a lot of tyre punctures and his, his parents are able to manage that. So I think this is going to work. What about this uh, process of learning to muster sheep? Well, I've put a few green bubbles up there uh, on this bubble chart that might be a training intervention. So goal-directed training, home programs, constraint-induced movement therapy by manual. Now, Tom has dyskinetic cerebral palsy. It affects all four limbs. So we can take out constraint and by manual because they're just for hemiplegic cerebral palsy. They're not appropriate for him. So already we've got a deduction down to two. We might also want to consider co-op because mustering has a motor component, but it also has a cognitive component. You've sort of got to outwit the sheep. So perhaps this is something. It also is showing possibility for people with dyskinetic cerebral palsy. Uh, so we've got three options here. So how do we choose? So we select one of them. These are things, the mechanism of action. Do they match the goal of mustering? Well, yes, all three of those interventions are based on activity-dependent plasticity. What about the comorbidities? He has epilepsy. So I have to think about the supervision. He's not gonna be able to train outside on the farm unsupervised in case he has a seizure, he's gonna need help. 
So what's his family support structures? His dad is an expert musterer and is happy to help with the training component and is happy to uh, supervise him. Okay, so now we move on to this component. What is the mode? We've still got three interventions we're trying to choose between. Mode. Mode means how is it going to be delivered? It's equally important to think about this component. Is it going to be face-to-face? -face? Is it going to be virtual? Is it going to be individual? Is it going to be group? And different interventions, some of them work in all formats, but some of them only work in one format. So you have to know the evidence for that to actually do this decision making. So the wheelchair, of course, has got to be done face to face. We've got to get a good person environment fit. He's got to be able to use that joystick uh, effectively to be able to keep up with the sheep. The mustering, hmm, I don't know about you, but I don't have a lot of sheep at my therapy centre. I have had a kangaroo, <laughs> true story. This one we agree on telehealth. <laughs> he lives in a rural and remote area of Australia. So the next step on the read model is to think about the dose. It's no point choosing a green light intervention but underdosing the treatment. You still won't get a result. So what's the known effective dose? So we looked at those receiver operator curves before and the doses for these three choices we're looking at are pretty similar in this case, 14 hours, 12 hours. So the family can choose. And they go ahead and choose the green light, the biggest one there that's most likely to work, the goal-directed training. So here is Tom out on the farm mustering sheep. And we check in with him, has it worked? After we put a webcam on his chair and we did some training in the real environment. And he says, yes, I'm an eight out of 10. Almost all the sheep get in the pen now. <laughs> so. so here are the take home messages. Wikipedia can't interpret change. However, the extraordinary advances in this field in prevention, genetics, evidence options, and diagnosis are changing the size of the effect and also changing the number of options. We're gonna have more options in the future. We need to remain open-minded about that. Wikipedia can't read children's minds However, if we ask children what's important to them, activity-based intervention that focuses directly on their goal in their environment produces faster and superior results and also more cost-effective results to the health system. Wikipedia can't make a decision for you, but the READ model might help you with decision-making. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Iona. As an editor, um, I would be biased in a critique of Wikipedia. So I didn't say you were an OT, but I think everybody understood it because you are a true storyteller and also a story maker. Uh -huh. The take home message um, is that we should not be sheep. <laughs> and I think it's I an like important it. one. So we, we can take questions, and while you're preparing your question, I have one or two. I'll, I'll ask them both, and then you can choose. One is, so you showed us uh, that CP changed over the time, and in, in terms of epidemiology, well, we, we can go back to the 1950s, for example, and then went to half one in a thousand in the seventies, back to two in a thousand in the nineties, and you say now we, we gang down again. Is CP now in twenty twenty two still an optimal concept? That's one. And the other one <laughs> is you emphasized early intervention. Uh, you show the development of a uh, proven effect uh, of some approaches. Do you think that with therapy, therapeutic intervention applied very early on after birth, we might be able to cure CP? Your choice. He asks hard questions, doesn't he? <laughs> I'm a black sheep, so I'll give it a go. Uh, 
Do I think we can cure cerebral palsy with early intervention? I, I think one day there will be cures for cerebral palsy, and I say cures with an S. They're going to be very early treatments. They're likely to be maternal treatments. They're likely to be neonatal treatments. I, I, I don't believe we're seeing the sort of effect sizes in rehabilitation that is going to deliver a cure. So I'm quite scientific about that. But I'm not naive that that combination of immunology and thinking about inflammation and epigenetics may deliver something we can't even dream of in this room today. However, the important thing is to focus on the now for people with cerebral palsy, what they want. Uh, so, there. And uh, I think cerebral palsy is a changing panorama. And uh, we saw big fluctuations in the rate with the introduction of neonatal care. The rate went up originally as we saved more babies. But the rates come down. And the rate has come down and it's consistently down for two years in a row, uh, suggesting a trend in this direction. So I think cerebral palsy is a changing panorama. Uh, but we certainly have work to do in low-income countries where the rates are a lot higher and the severity is higher. So it's about us all collaborating to get the best results that matter to people with cerebral palsy. Yeah. Another question. That, ah, that, there's one down there. So microphone is there. And so another question we, we had, you and I, about your developments is, um, so you, you showed us, uh, uh, Tom, in rural Australia, uh, how does this approach worldwide in, in other settings, which are even, you know, different from rural Australia? Yeah, that's an important question. When we wrote that international clinical practice guideline, it, it did include an international panel of people from around the world. And we very deliberately made a very small number of recommendations about technology to make it equitable. So most of the interventions are low-cost interventions that don't require any specialist equipment. Some of the ones I showed you on video today obviously are only available in certain income settings. But that's a very important point because social equity of health is very important. And you get the biggest results from these uh, non-technology uh, interventions anyway. Thank you. There's a question over there. I'm Anjan from Kolkata, India, and um, we have worked together in LEAP CP study, and uh, considering that low cost, uh, low income solution, is there anything that we would like to know from you about that model so that we can get into that curing uh, disabilities uh, question? Thank you. Well, I, I think um, in the functional therapy guideline that we showed you there on screen, most of those interventions are low cost and they uh, re give big effect sizes for helping include people and help them achieve their goals. So I think there's lots of things in there. So uh, goal-directed training is something that can be done in any context. Uh, understanding task-specific training and um, some of these others. So I think they're, they're, they're light touch. I'm not saying rehabilitation will deliver a cure. I think that's going to come from other places and other parts of collaborations with medicine. But um, I, I think for now, the effect sizes look the best when we ask children, and I mean ask children. We often ask parents or we use our eyes and estimate for people what would be an important goal, but ask children themselves because they set their own goals and that's a very powerful way um, to get a result. I think uh, we also need to be collaborating with um, low and middle income countries, ensuring that the things that do prevent cerebral palsy or reduce the severity, so magnesium sulphate, hyperthermia, and some of these other interventions uh, are available. So magnesium sulphate is a very cheap intervention um, to use, as like less than a euro per person to use. So I think there are some things we can do in low-income contexts to help prevent as well, which is also important. And a question here. Hello, my name is Claudia Tetlian. I'm 36 years old. I have cerebral palsy. I was born when I was 22 weeks in Pragna, my mother, and you really touched me because you give hope for a lot, not you only, all, oh, all of, sorry, all of you because I live a, a full life with cerebral palsy and psychologists and I'm conference, but I'm an exception nowadays. And I think that the children in the future can live life in the way that they want. 
with no pain and with less difficulties. And maybe the cure is more soon, is sooner than we think. So I just really thankful for all of you, everything. I thought that was a beautiful conclusion for this session, and it is. And Can beyond I, this, we're going to take a, a question from elsewhere. Thank you very much, Claudia. But can I also say thank you for sharing your story, the humility. You're clearly a survivor, and you are extraordinary. And we're listening to you. Thank you very much. And you make a very important point about reduction in pain. Three in four people with cerebral palsy experience pain. And it has an extraordinary impact on your life. And that's one of the simple but important pieces of evidence we can follow. Thank you so much for your wisdom and for coming to the session. I really appreciate you. I work for you. Wait, wait, wait. I'm the president of a non-profit organization, Convives con Espasticidad, living with spasticity, and I want to keep in touch with you I if it's possible. That. So thank you very much, and thank you for all. I'm sorry for ties because, but it's my feelings, you know. Yeah. Thank you. They're very important feelings. Thank you for sharing them. Let's. Let's all meet together in a more informal way uh, than this. I think this has been a great, a great, great keynote lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.